Minister of Health to open the debate on the bill. Minister Robin Swan. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Speaker, I'm delighted to finally be opening the debate in the Assembly on the Organ and Tissue Donation Team Consent Bill. And it is by chance, uh, but also entirely fitting, that I am doing so on this, the first day of this year's Organ Donation Week. The bill broadly mirrors the provisions set out in the three clauses of the Organ Donation Team Consent Act 2019, in that it seeks to amend the relevant parts of the Human Tissues Act of 2004. It has been long awaited by all who are involved in the organ donation process. There have been many challenges and delays in bringing this bill forward. However, the strong public support for this bill can leave no doubt that this is the right time to make a real difference to people's lives in Northern Ireland. And at this stage, Mr. Speaker, I want to pay tribute to all those that have long campaigned for this move today, including the family of young Daki McGachan, uh, but in particular, I also want to thank the person who personally first convinced me almost a decade ago that our organ donation laws needed to change. In December 2012, Joanne Dobson tabled her private member's bill. At that time, it was a trailblazing piece of legislation and it looked that Northern Ireland was going to help lead the way. Without rehearsing the details, however, Joanne's bill was not given the political support it deserved, and in the years since, our organ donation laws fell rapidly behind those of all our neighbours. But this bill is a chance to put that right. The Organ and Tissue Donation Deem Consent Bill will strengthen the current legislative framework around organ donation and will increase the current rate of consent in the small number of cases in which it is clinically possible for organ donation to proceed after a person's death. Doing so will increase the overall number of donors and ultimately the number of life-saving organs available for transplantation. My officials have considered in detail the legislative developments relating to organ donation in other jurisdictions in the United Kingdom. And members will find that the bill will introduce measures similar to those in place in Wales since 2015, England since 2020, and in Scotland since March of this year. The consent rate in Wales has increased from 58% in 2015 to 70.7% in 2020. Although the impact was not immediate and took several years to begin to take effect, following an extensive media promotion and information campaign by the Welsh Government, and in England and Scotland it is too soon, actually too soon to analyse the impact of the consent rates. But all of the provisions in the Bill have been subject to a public consultation that was held late in 2020 and extensive stakeholder engagement. Respondents to the consultation included key stakeholders from the statutory and voluntary sectors, as well as the professional and clinical community, with responses to the consultation indicating overwhelming support for the bill. Nevertheless, Speaker, I do acknowledge that there are a range of views within and outside the clinical and professional community, which must be fully respected and engaged with as part of the ongoing discussion around organ donation. Whilst it would not be appropriate for me to speak on any clinician's behalf on this issue, I would assure you that my officials have had significant engagement with clinical and nursing leads who specialise in organ donation and transplantation as part of the consultation process and continue to do so in preparation for the legislative process. I wish to thank those who took the time to respond to the consultation or who attended any of the consultation events. I also wish to thank the Health Committee and its members for opening a call for evidence over the summer recess, as this should permit committee scrutiny to commence later this month. As the scrutiny process begins, the Assembly can have confidence that this bill has had the benefit of extensive stakeholder engagement and input by the various stakeholder groups that met on many occasions to consider these policy proposals. This bill will mean that adults in Northern Ireland will be considered potential donors unless they choose to opt out or are excluded. Around 115 people in Northern Ireland are on the transplant waiting list, and every year around 10 to 15 people in Northern Ireland die waiting on an organ transplant. This bill will help to reduce the number of people waiting for life-saving transplants. This will require new primary legislation to change the current system in Northern Ireland in which people can choose to opt in or opt out on the organ donation register to a new statutory opt-out system 
and which consent is deemed or presumed except, except in certain exempt circumstances or if a person has made a decision to opt out during their lifetime. This is sometimes known as deemed consent. The main policy objective is to increase the current rate of consent in the small number of cases in which it is clinically possible for organ donation to proceed after a person's death. Doing so will increase the overall numbers of donors and ultimately the number of life-saving organs available for transplantation. It will be considered that everyone living in Northern Ireland agrees to donate their organs when they die, unless they have confirmed otherwise by opting out on the organ donor register, or otherwise making their decision known or they are from one of the excluded groups. It is acknowledged that legislative change alone will not achieve a sustained increase in organ donation consent rates. It can be a potential enabler to further progress towards this goal if it is combined with increased public awareness and knowledge. Countries with mature opt-out systems and high rates of consent, for example Spain, tend to have high levels of public support and understanding around the benefits of organ donation and transplantation. The introduction of an opt-out system for Northern Ireland must therefore be combined with continued efforts to promote public and professional education and long-term behavioural change. My department will therefore continue to implement the commitments set out in its 2018 policy statement in line with the statutory duty to promote transplantation, which was conferred on and by Part 4 of the Health Miscellaneous Provisions Act 2016. The overall objective of the policy is to promote a positive, cultural, long-term change in attitudes and behaviours in relation to organ donation. My department is working with the health and social care system, the public sector, which includes local government and the education system, and wider society to promote organ donation through a coordinated and sustained communication programme. These commitments are not impact, impacted by the proposed move to a statutory opt-out system and will remain in place during and after the implementation of any new legislative framework. I have accepted the recommendation of the Organ Donation Clinical Advisory Group, and I am proposing that the draft bill should include further statutory provision which will effectively enhance my department's statutory duty with specific reference to promoting and reporting on soft, out, soft opt-out on an ongoing basis. Whilst the change in law will not increase the size of the UK donor pool, it has the potential to increase the consent rate in situations where a potential organ donor has been identified. This is generally a person from whom further intensive care has no prospect of bringing about recovery. In Northern Ireland and in other UK regions until recently, this consent rate has remained around about two-thirds of potential donors. So the strategic aim is a sustained consent rate at 80 per cent or higher. The bill sets out a number of exempt groups to whom deemed consent provisions will not apply. These people can still become organ donors after they die, but consent will continue to be sought from families. These exempt groups uh, are children and young people under the age of 18, adults who lack capacity to understand the new system, uh, for an example, an, an adult with advanced dementia or severe learning difficulties, people whose identity is unknown, and people who are not ordinary resident in Northern Ireland. And that would include, for example, tourists, students, or overseas armed forces. Organs donated for research purposes or when the transplant is considered novel or rare will not be included under this bill. There will also be strict safeguards in place, and specialist nurses will always discuss organ donation with families so an individual's wishes are respected. Mr. Speaker, 49% of our population have now joined the NHS Organ Donor Register a steady increase from 30% since 2013. Many more than this, consistently around 90%, say that they support organ donation. However, this means that families are often left with a difficult decision when a loved one dies. Approximately one in four families decide not to proceed with donation when faced with this decision, most often because they do not know what their loved one would have wanted or what decisions they have made. When families know that their loved one would have wanted, they are much more likely to honour these wishes. So the effect of the proposed change to the current law 
will be to shift the focus to the donation conversation, which is conducted with families at the end of life by expert NHS specialist nurses. And that's in order to establish the known decisions of their loved ones. Every other part of the end of life care pathway will remain unchanged and conducted in line with current clinical and professional standards. Under the bill, the government's public awareness campaign will help uh, raise awareness of the new system before it will come into force in spring 2023 and give people the time to have the conversations they need. Organ donation is deeply personal and a deeply personal decision for everyone, which is why we will be launching a public awareness campaign to ensure people understand the new system and the choices available to them. Those individuals who do not wish to donate their organs will still be able to record their decision on the NHS Organ Donation Register. They will be able to do this through NHS Blood and Transplants website or helpline. Under the new law, being an organ donor will still be your choice. Organ donation will remain a priceless gift. Mr Speaker, I want to thank everyone for your patience while I have provided this overview of this bill. And I hope you will agree that this remarkable change in legislation proceeds in order that we may achieve the necessary changes to the organ donation process that will make a real difference to so many lives. It is important that everyone takes the time to discuss their choices on donation with their families and register their wishes, whatever their preference may be. We envisage a year from, from the passing of the bill in the Assembly uh, to the bill goes live. This will allow us the time to revise and implement the codes of practice, train staff and ensure that the public are made aware of the change in law, but my department has already a comprehensive plan in place for that. So, Mr Speaker, it is my delight that I beg to move. I thank the Minister for that. And I now call the Chairperson of the Committee for Health, Colm Gildernew. Um, I welcome the opportunity today to make some initial remarks on behalf of the Health Committee, outlining the Committee's consideration of the Bill before speaking uh, as my party's health spokesperson. As the Minister has outlined, this Bill aims to change the statutory framework for organ and tissue donation in the North to a soft opt-out opt or deemed consent system. The policy objective is to increase the current rate of consent in the small number of cases in which it is clinically possible for organ donation to proceed after a person's death. The issue of organ and tissue donation is a very important and also, as the Minister has outlined, an emotive issue. It really is an issue of life and death for people in our families and communities. And If the Bill passes this stage, the Committee welcomes the opportunity to scrutinise this very important piece of legislation. One of the first informal meetings that myself and the Deputy Chairperson of the Committee, Pam Cameron, held was with young Dahi McGowan. Dahi and his family have played an important role in getting this legislation to the Assembly. They deserve massive credit for putting the issue in the headlines and being such great advocates themselves for our organ donation. There are many others, and I am keenly aware of many others who have played a part in bringing forward this legislation, and I want to thank them for their advocacy and promotion of organ donation including Joanne Dobson, formerly a member of this Assembly, and Fergal McKinney and the, the BHF, who have campaigned vigorously on this issue over the years. On Wednesday evening, members, the committee held a stakeholder event with many people who have gone through the process, the transplant process, and those who worked to support those going through that process. We gained valuable knowledge, and it was brilliant to hear the first-hand ex experience of people who had significantly benefited from a transplant, and some of the difficulties that they faced also. I would like to thank those who took part in that engagement, and a very special thanks to the Patient and Client Council and the Assembly's engagement team for facilitating the event, and I will mention some of the discussions that we had during that at a later stage. The Department, as the Minister has indicated there, also ran a consultation on the proposed legislative changes at the end of last year, and the Committee received information to say that there was broad support for the proposed changes. The Committee wrote to the Department to outline the importance of publishing the outcome of that consultation as soon as possible, and the Committee welcomes the fact that the Department have published that analysis of responses on Friday. The Committee was briefed by officials at its meeting on the 9th of September on the principles of this Bill. Officials provided members with some of the statistics in relation to organ donation and the reasons why the Department is introducing the legislation. 
They also outlined the various exemptions that would apply to the bill and how the bill proposes an extension to the existing duty to promote and inform the public about deemed consent and the individual's right to opt in or opt out of deemed consent. During the briefing, members raised a number of questions in relation to the impact of similar legislation in other jurisdictions, definitions contained within the legislation and how the department planned to outline how definitions will be agreed, the role of educating under 18s in relation to organ donation, and the exemptions and how they will apply to particular groups. As I mentioned earlier, the committee held a stakeholder event last week on the bill to seek the views of those who have benefited in the past from organ donations and groups who support donors and recipients of organ donations. It was a very well attended event by both stakeholders and members. We discussed questions around whether they felt this proposal would increase donors, how medical professionals discuss this issue with families and how we can promote organ and tissue donation in our communities. As I mentioned earlier, we received a wealth of information from that event, and it was clear that these individuals and groups were supportive of the proposed changes. We look forward to continuing engagement on the bill, and we would encourage people to respond to the committee's consultation on the bill. The committee agreed to go out for consultation following the introduction of first stage in July. This was due in part to the very significant and heavy legislative schedule that the committee will have over the coming months. And I do have to say that the committee is disappointed that this and other executive bills did not get introduced sooner and provide the committee with additional time to undertake its scrutiny role. It is frustrating that the committee is in a position where it is considering very significant executive bills and private members' bills in a time-limited manner. Providing the bill passes second stage the committee looks forward to engaging with stakeholders and scrutinising the bill in further detail. So, Kian Corley, if I may now, I'd like to make a few short remarks as a Sinn Féin spokesperson for health. Sinn Féin welcome and support the organ and tissue donation bill. This is, in my opinion, assembly politics at its best, where all of us who are elected to this body are doing exactly what the public say they want. The soft out option organ option, donation option is widely supported across our communities. I want to pay tribute to all of those families who have campaigned for this for so long. Their dignity, sacrifice and unselfishness on this issue, uh, so urgent is to many of them, is to be commended. They have never lost hope and this is really their accomplishment at the end of the day. It is their determination and hard work that has brought us to this point. Soft opt-out organ donation will save the lives of our families, our loved ones and our friends. It is regrettable that there was a delay to bring in the, uh, the bill forward um, from the DUP and also I think it is hugely regrettable that the threat to this assembly could impact on the outworking of this bill and on, on bringing this bill forward. And I think the, uh, the reference earlier to the, the bill having been brought to an advanced stage and then not having come through demonstrates to us the danger of, uh, of, of opportunity not being taken to move forward on important issues. So we all individually have a responsibility now to talk to our families and loved ones about soft opt-out organ donation as an everyday occurrence and to normalise the practice so that there is an understanding of the importance to each and every one of us of signing up to be an organ donor. And I'd just finally like to return briefly to that meeting which has been mentioned that Pam and I did with, with uh, Dahi and Marching and Seth um, McGowan, the second meeting actually we'd done informally as, as Chair and Deputy Chair. And just to point out, and I brought this down with me today, this, this still is, is printed up in my notice board. It's hard to make out, but it's a drawing, it's a drawing that Dahi done on the day he was in the office. Because, of course, while we were talking about organ donation and all the rest of it, all Dahi wanted to do was get on with living Dahi's life. So this is, this is a, a picture of Dahi's favourite footballer, which happens to be Mo Salah. I'm not sure how much of his Dahi's input and how much of his Seth, to be honest, but I don't, want to, I don't want to put Seth under pressure. But I just want to highlight that Dahi McGowan is a wee man who needs a heart. But all he wants to do is get on with being Dahi McGowan. It's up to us to do the right thing to deliver for Dahi and all of those other people who so badly need and will benefit from organ donation. Army Agat. Army Agat, thank you. And I call Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I rise to speak on my own behalf to support the principles of this bill. 
and I do so after considered thought. And I'm very conscious of the sensitivities around the issues at the core of the Organ and Tissue Donation Deem Consent Bill. Mr Speaker, we will all know someone who has required an organ donation to improve their quality of life, or indeed to save their life. And it is that life-giving at a time when life is ending that is one of the truly inspiring things about organ donation. That new life, better life, can come as a result of the loss of another. Hope and maybe even a little comfort from sadness and grief. Broadly speaking, we talk of presumed consent, that consent having to be actively withdrawn to stop organs being donated. So at the core remains a choice, rights and the ability not to be a part of this. And I fully respect those who decide that organ donation is not for them. And I would encourage them to think again, but they are entitled to do so and that right must remain. And fundamentally, we must ensure that those who do opt out are not stigmatised, pressurised or marginalised for exercising the rights made clear in this bill. Mr Speaker, the bill does include a range of groups or situations that may arise, and I welcome this. The bill will not apply to adults in the following categories or circumstances. People who lack the capability to fully understand the consequences of deemed consent for a significant period before dying. No changes are proposed to the rules on consent to organ donation in respect of children under 18. It will not cover those people who have expressly made a decision on consent before their death, either by recording their decision to give or refuse consent or appointing someone to make that decision on their behalf. Deemed consent will not apply where a person in a qualifying relationship to the deceased partners, certain family members or a friend of long standing provides information that would lead a reasonable person to conclude that the deceased potential organ donor would not have consented to be an organ donor. This bill does not propose any change to the consent concerning transplants from living persons and the consent of the donor will continue to be required in those circumstances. These are welcome exclusions, but I believe further clarity is needed in a number of areas. We must have a clear understanding of the significance of family consent which is traditionally lower than the overall rate of support for organ donation. Furthermore, the definition of qualifying relationship in context of family consent must be clarified. Who falls into this character category? And is it open to challenge and dispute amongst families, for example? We must also have provision for when a family member cannot be reached under the bill's approach. In Scotland, the presumption seems to be that donation can proceed. What will be the approach here in Northern Ireland? where many people have children who have moved away to study, work or live and are not always contactable easily or quickly. Another key issue as we explore how this would work is the role of clinicians. In this area we need to ensure we protect our medical professionals from additional pressure from potential challenge. We need further clarity on whether clinicians are likely to move ahead with the donation, even though someone in a qualifying relationship cannot present evidence that their loved one would not have consented. In the same vein, we need to be clear around the definition of information or recorded evidence that would be accepted for the purposes of demonstrating someone's wishes. These are difficult times for those mourning the loss of a loved one, Mr Speaker, and it is a time where additional stress and strain is not needed. I will. Member for Giveaway, I, I join with her in uh, strongly supporting uh, this bill. Um, can I say she, she makes a very valid point in terms of the position of those who are mourning, who have just lost a loved one. That is an incredibly stressful time for families. It can lead, I think, to very difficult conversations at times between clinicians and family. And the more that we can ease that conversation, both in terms of where the clarity lies within the bill. Uh, but also, I think, very specifically, in encouraging that level of communication between potential organ donors uh, and their families, I think is, is critical. As someone who has signed up to the um, organ donation register, I don't know necessarily how, what a long line of clinicians will be there for any of my organs whenever they, they go, but I, I, I leave that uh, to their professional judgment. But I, I wouldn't like to see a situation in which uh, my family was saying then, turning around and saying no to that, which is why I've had the conversation uh, with my family, and one of the byproducts. I know when we debated really last this issue in terms of legislation about six years ago, uh, one of the uh, reticence, elements of reticence um, in the what was then effectively the embryonic Welsh model 
was the issue of whether, from a practical point of view, would, would this lead to more donations or, or less donations? And in many ways, we, we've scoped that out. But one of the byproducts, I think, of the Welsh system um, has been that, both in terms of the legislative changes, had an impact, but also actually that it stimulated conversation uh, and conversation between families. And would the member agree with me? It is that communication between families that, in many ways, will be as significant and the raising of the, of the issue as the actual legislative changes. Uh, thank uh, my colleague for that intervention. Yes, and agree wholeheartedly with that position. And certainly, I remember uh, from past days looking at uh, a similar issue on the Health Committee, and I was very conscious that there were many clinicians who were nervous around um, this type of legislation at that point, and, and they were very uh, anxious to, to see the results coming from Wales and, and to see the impact that that would have on the availability of, of organs. But it is vital to have that conversation. I think that's the most important thing that we can do as individuals is to be very clear with our, with our families and with our friends and our loved ones so that they know should the opportunity arise, and we've heard from the Health Minister, it's probably a very s slim opportunity that that could actually arise. But in the event that that should arise, that our wishes are fully known and um, protected in that vein. Mr Speaker, as I conclude my remarks, I want to reiterate my support for the intentions of the Bill, but I do believe we need additional clarity on the points I have raised, and which other colleagues around this chamber will also highlight in the course of this debate. Given that the rates of family consent for donation remain low, with 35% of families in Scotland and England refusing consent for donation between 2018 and 2019, it is vital that we know what the wishes of our loved ones are. I have often talked about uh, what I believe to be the most important issue around organ donation, whether we are opting in or opting out. For me personally, the most important issue is and remains around the awareness of this subject. This bill provides further opportunity to create debate and discussion on this most sensitive of subjects. This is a good thing, and I think for most of us, the most important thing is to be clear on what friends and family wishes are at the end of life, and who among us would not want those wishes to become a reality. I trust that this debate does indeed stimulate those critical conversations, and that once a decision has been made, that that decision is clearly communicated for the peace and mind of all involved. I want to put uh, on record at this stage my gratitude and appreciation to the many individuals and organisations who have campaigned passionately to bring this bill to this stage. And I think in particular of young Dahi McGowan and his parents, who were my first meeting with the chair um, as deputy chair of the Health Committee. And also on this first day of Organ Donation Week 2021, I would urge everyone to join the Organ uh, Donor Register and have that conversation with your families. And I would also at this stage call uh, on the, the Health Minister to look at ways to ramp up the organ donation education and awareness across all age groups and society. This, again, in my opinion, is the, uh, the most important uh, ingredient to increasing the availability of organs and I would suggest respectfully that we do not wait for the outcome of this legislation but prepare now to meet the needs of those who wait for organs today. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ms Cara Hunter. Thank you Mr Principal Deputy Speaker and I welcome the opportunity today to speak on this important next stage of this bill. Just last week with the Health Committee we had a briefing with the Patient Client Council with both recipients and those who have donated organs and their families. It was a real eye opener learning first hand about how this has impacted both their lives and the lives of their families. Especially listening to David, father of Lucia, talking about his daughter's journey with organ donation and the legacy and campaign that she leaves behind. Another eye-opening aspect was discussing the barriers to organ donation, cultural, religious and some barriers even including superstition. I hope that as this bill progresses through the Assembly at each stage, hopefully as quickly as possible, that both the Departments of Health and Education remain committed to opening the conversation around donation, to informing and educating, removing the social and societal awkwardness that often looms around organ donation and especially educating our under-18s. The donation and organ, of organs and tissues after death helps to, save, helps to both save and improve many lives in the North every year. It is just incredible to think that one donor can transform the lives of up to nine people. 
If we look at the current statistics, last year in the North there were just 51 deceased donors, but this resulted in 113 transplants throughout the UK. In total, 87 Northern Irish residents received a transplant. It really is incredible to think of the lives that can be changed. One of the 87 recipients happened to be my constituent, a young man named Michael from Valley Kelly. Now, Michael isn't much older than me, but he has severe complications and damage to his kidney. He now lives life with his kidney functioning at 8%. I find uh, him truly inspiring. Every day is a battle for him, but he holds out hope that he will someday soon get the call. And that's the heartbreaking thing about uh, having issues with your organs. It truly is the luck of the draw. None of us know when we will need one or if it will be any of us facing these challenges we're discussing today. So it really is crucial that we get talking with our constituents wherever possible about it today to preserve life tomorrow. Currently, there is a shortage of donors in the North, with around 115 people waiting for a transplant. But if we look at how the opt-out system has changed things with its introduction in Wales, with the consent rates from deceased donors um, increasing over 12% in 2020. Uh, lastly, I'd like to thank young Dahi and his committed parents for their ongoing focused campaign on organ donation. We in the SDLP wholeheartedly support this bill and hope it contributes to a societal shift in getting families talking, parents talking, teachers talking and uh, people realising the importance of donating organs. So let's get talking and let's get donating. Thank you. Mr Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker. Uh, it's a real pleasure actually to get up and, and speak even briefly uh, on this bill. Um, obviously, as the Ulster Unionist uh, rep, the first to speak in a while and will speak shortly, we will be uh, speaking in support of the bill. Um, and I think back to 2016 uh, when I first became an MLA, I was allocated a role in the Health Committee. Now, I wasn't the health spokesperson, I was, I was deputy to Joanne Dobson. I uh, had been given the portfolio of mental health, which has is, is, is been excellent, but I did work side by side with Joanne Dobson at that time in 2016. And that obviously was hot on the heels of, of uh, the failure of being able to get the bill through uh, first time round. But I just want to put on record, as the Minister already has, my thanks to Joanne Dobson and, and her absolute uh, uh, resolution to, to see change. And uh, since um, leaving politics, Joanne has continued on that quest to pursue this uh, issue as, uh, as a real priority, to help change and transform the lives of many people across uh, Northern Ireland uh, who need it. So, Joanne, thank you. I'm sure you will indeed be listening. Um, this is only the second stage of the bill, and obviously there's the consultation to come through, which we'll look forward to getting the detail of. But I hope uh, that anybody within this chamber who still needs to be convinced um, uh, by the end of the journey of this bill will not need convinced and that this will receive unanimous support through its stages. If anybody is, uh, has any doubts as to why uh, we need uh, this um, legislation, I'll just list a, a couple of, of reasons. For any of us uh, to, to, to remain in and to uh, offer that option of uh, the donation of, of organs, the, the opportunity to help others in life is the most important thing that any of us can do. Uh, in any walk of life, whether that is whilst we're alive or, or, or actually at that point when, when, we, when we leave this place. And even that thought to know that you are offering and there is the potential to help others should fill everybody with a sense of joy. Sadly, uh, in many ways, there will always be those in need. This is my second point. And whether that's through a diagnosed medical condition, condition or whether it's through uh, a moment of trauma in someone's life, there will always be those that need uh, an, an organ, uh, and, and, and we'll be looking to see if there, there is someone that is, that is suitable. And those lists, sadly, um, do grow. As I've said, people are waiting, and, and we've spoke already, and, and it would be remiss of me not to talk about young Dahi from West Belfast. I had the, the absolute pleasure of meeting him um, when uh, Deidre Hargy was the, the, the mayor uh, in Belfast City Council. She, she had a reception. For him, and it was just before Christmas, I think it was the 27th of November, and I was able to hold him in my arms, which was great because COVID wasn't a thing. And his infectious personality, and it still does, it masks the danger that that young boy is in. He's an absolutely beautiful young boy. He's a credit, and anybody that's met him will, 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 will verify that. And if you watch the social media that his, his, I think his mum and his dad run, it's fabulous. You see, he has met just about everybody across Northern Ireland. He has met 
people from all backgrounds. He has met loyalists, he has met unionists, he has met nationalists, he has met republicans, he has met people who don't designate to either. He met the first minister, and I think he was going to have a boxing match with the first minister. Can you imagine what length that list is? And Dahi goes right to the front of that list, the land one on the first minister. Credit to his family for the effort that they have put in over this past number of years. Another thing that is sometimes missed is that one donor can help more than one person. Now, not to get into too much of the technicalities of other stuff, uh, you know, organ donation can help. One person can help many, many people. And if you think about the natural evolution of thinking about that, um, not only is the family of the, the person who's going to benefit going to feel good, but very often the family of the person who's perhaps deceased can also benefit in knowing that part of their uh, loved one is helping someone else live uh, a fulfilling and successful life, even in that midst of, of absolute grief of having lost their their loved one. But for me, uh, perhaps, uh, and for some of you, you may agree with me, but for me, it is the hope that it offers. Because when you are on a list, it is no guarantee, even if we change the bill, that, that, that the moment will happen. But it is the hope. And I think if we can give people hope, it will increase their days. Not only will it increase their days, it will increase the quality of their life to know that there are people out there who absolutely care about them and care about their chances. I'm not going to say too much more, uh, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, but just I would like to pick up on something that the, the Chair of the Health Committee he did mention, uh, that there is the fear of these institutions falling. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on it, but there is also the point that these institutions were on their knees for three years as well, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. So for the two parties, let's learn from the mistakes of our past. We've been through enough in Northern Ireland. Let's move on into the realms of what we can do, what we can do together. You will find no more willing party than the Ulster Unionist Party to increase dialogue and to ensure that we do the best and give the people of Northern Ireland the best life chances that we can give them. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Ms Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I rise um, appropriately at the start of Organ Donation Week strongly to support the bill and to urge that it be passed swiftly as it should be uncontentious, but it does contain a provision for a delay of one year until it takes effect. If I could start by joining others um, in the chamber here today to encourage those listening in to take the two minutes to register on the organ donation registration, um, to share that decision with their families. Parents may also wish to consider that their children, though unaffected by this bill as it stands, can also opt to be donors. With regards to the legislation before us, um, Principal Deputy Speaker, this is essentially an amending bill, doing something which we really should have done a long time ago. It is indeed in itself just one step of a journey which I hope will see Northern Ireland come to reach the international target rate of 80 per cent transplants from deceased donors. We saw in Wales that this figure increased from 58 per cent to 71 per cent after similar legislation was passed demonstrating both the value of the legislation itself, but also of the need for further work. This is only made more significant by the fact that the comparable figure lags behind in Northern Ireland at 64 per cent of pre-COVID. This is why we have no time to lose. We need to move on swiftly with this legislation and then get on with the awareness raising which is implicit in it. The bill has a set of exemptions which cover any concerns which have been raised um, with the um, Health Committee and the Department over the years. It applies only to deceased adults who are resident full-time in Northern Ireland at time of death and also makes other alliances. In many ways, the legislation will, in fact, in and of itself be less important than the awareness raising that comes from it. Two questions arise from today's debate. The first is why it takes so long for this Assembly to get around to passing even simple legislation such as this, which is something there is something fundamentally wrong with a system which makes obvious and life saving steps take much longer than they need to. Those threatening the ability of these institutions to pass literally life saving laws over the next few months need to reflect on that. The second is what form the awareness raising will take over the year, which understandably has been set aside for it. 
as well as for preparing for the legislative change. I have raised concerns before, over, such as over the COVID regulations, about how the public um, has been left unclear about decisions being made here and how they are affected by them. It is essential, therefore, that we have a strong publicity package ready to go imminently for when the legislation is passed. I would note again that awareness raising should also cover the potential for anyone of any age, even if not covered by this bill, to opt in. We may need to consider how this is made easier. Mr um, Principal Deputy Speaker, others have mentioned some of those who have campaigned for this legislation. I myself have been very grateful for direct discussions going back many years with um, our former colleague of this House, Joanne Dobson. I am thankful to the determination and guidance of the McGowan family, and I also would applaud the work of the British Heart Foundation and Chest um, Heart and Stroke, who both have campaigned diligently over many years. Um, there are, in fact, also many others who have been quietly pushing for this behind the scene, and some of them um, will obviously be watching it today. Um, their in input has been incredibly valuable as well. Um, and lastly, I would also thank the departmental officials and others throughout the health um, uh, and social care family for their work behind the scenes in getting us to this point. This legislation has our full and unreserved support, as indeed does Organ Donation Week. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, as this is Anya Murphy's first opportunity to speak as a private member, I would remind the House that it is the convention of this place that a maiden speech is made without interruption. I call Ms Anya Murphy. I am honoured to rise today to make my maiden speech as an MLA for Fermanagh and South Tyrone. I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to my predecessor, Sean Lynch, for all of the hard work that he carried out over the last 10 years. The people of Fermanagh and South Tyrone have fell foul to regional imbalance over the last number of years in respect to many local issues. Infrastructure, health, agriculture and lack of investment from economy. The list could go on. This lack of investment dates back to the introduction of partition, which has a noticeable effect on many services still. The people of Fermanagh and South Tyrone own many businesses, employ staff from their local communities and contribute significantly to society as a whole. The time for constituencies west of the ban, including Fermanagh and South Tyrone, being forgot about is over. I will fight for additional funding to be made available to Fermanagh and South Tyrone which will help improve services for everyone. Within my own area, I will work to spearhead the new Listen Ski Health Centre project. This project has been ongoing for a number of years and has seen many roadblocks. The people of South Fermanagh deserve the same standard of healthcare infrastructure as everyone else in the North. The Minister needs to advance this project as soon as possible. We will not stand for any further unnecessary delays in relation to this. I am delighted that I have been given the opportunity to speak on the Organ and Tissue Donation Bill. I welcome the discussion on the work done to date on this. It is the result of the determined work of so many, not least the families, who are waiting so anxiously for an organ transplant for their loved ones. Within my area, the Western Health and Social Care Trust has had four organ donors between April 2019 and March 2020, which successfully resulted in 10 recipients receiving life-changing transplants. Organ donation provides many families with hope in their time of need and shows light at the end of the tunnel. I personally know a number of recipients of organ transplants within my own constituency. Recipients can spend months and years hoping and waiting for a suitable donor. Their physical health as well as mental health more than often deteriorates over this period, making it extremely difficult for them and their loved ones. Organ donation is one of the most selfless things that one human can do to help another, and it is rightfully referred to as giving the gift of life. Research completed by the, Brit by the British and Irish Heart Foundations around this bill showed there is widespread support through the North for this measure. 
More than seven out of ten of our constituents are in support of the soft opt-out option that will facilitate easier organ donation processes. The introduction of soft opt-out organ donation will help to deliver an increase in available organs for donation and to normalise organ donation as routine practice. This bill will better reflect the views of the populations and normalise the conversation around organ donation in our society. Ultimately, the policy objective of soft opt-out organ donation is to save more lives. I am an organ donor and I wholeheartedly encourage people to become organ donors and to discuss organ donation within their family and friends so that we can normalise organ donation as an everyday gesture in our lives. Thank you. And can I, from the chair, be the first to congratulate the member on making her maiden speech? It can be quite a daunting experience, especially when you look around the chamber at some of the faces that are looking at you. So, uh, congratulate the member on that. And the next person on my list is Mr. Paul Frew. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I'll take any compliment that you want to bring uh, my way. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, I rise here in what is a very serious topic that is literally a matter of life and death. And I would be the first in any queue or any group to talk about the merits of organ donation and what that has meant for people living out a full life and what that even means in death to people who have gifted their organs to people who are not as well off as their own themselves and has had the, the honour, the privilege and of, of, no, of, of, of their family members knowing that when they passed they were able to provide life for other people. Organ donation is a great <laughs> gift. Probably one of the greatest gifts that a person can bestow on another human being. And that must be applauded and must be encouraged. Uh, and I would also Mr. Frew, add, Mr. Mr. Frew, I'm sorry to interrupt you. If you could uh, just near your mic, just to add the hand, sorry for the record. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, it's not very often I'm told that I'm not heard, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. So uh, that's a novel one. Uh, so, again, organ donation is precious, it's brilliant, it's a gift that we can give. And I would encourage every single person to have that conversation with family members and to make their beliefs known and placed on record with family members. And I would also add, Mr. Depp, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that this House, this Assembly, its powers have been diminished over this last year with regards to the emergency powers that have been passed, which takes away the power and the role and the remit of this House when it comes to health regulations. And I am totally opposed to that continuing, because this should be the place, the members of this Legislative Assembly should be the place where decisions are taken on law for our people. So I welcome the opportunity to speak on this bill and every other piece of legislation that we will pass from now until the end of the mandate. But I would not be true to myself, Principal Deputy Speaker, if I did not share with you the members that are going to make this decision around my concerns around deemed consent. And I've heard two people speaking here today. And I think there is confusion, and I mean that respectfully, between legislation and organ donation. Organ donation is very good. It's very positive. It is one of the greatest gifts that a human being can bestow on another human being. That has to be lauded. That, ha that has to be a given. And that has to be convinced out there in our population. This legislation is about deemed consent. And I think, and I am yet to be convinced, that imposing deemed consent 
can actually add and increase the chances of increasing organ donation. And I worry about that. I have grave concerns because I want to see organ donation increase. I want to see it rise. And I don't want to see anybody die because they needed an organ. And I worry about this. I genuinely worry about this deemed consent. And it's for a number of reasons, one being ethical, but others being that I haven't seen the evidence that it actually works. Yes, I will. To prolong it, but in my own speech, I indicated that it was very clear that when the legislation was introduced in Wales, that there was a dramatic increase. So there are jurisdictions not very far from here that have demonstrated when the legislation is introduced that it does go up. So I, I don't get your point. Thank you. I have I've no problems with trying to clarify that point because the Minister has already said that when it was introduced in Wales, it had a very slow uptake in production. I will in a wee minute, Minister. I will, of course I will. But that it was only, only after the publicity campaign around it that it actually worked. And that's the point I make also before I bring the Minister in. There seems to be a confusion here between organ donation, good, brilliant, and deemed consent, where we talk about this bill being brilliant, when we should be talking about organ donation being brilliant. And then there's a confusion between the success of deemed consent and publicity campaigns that can change culture in our family setting. And to me, that's the most important aspect. And I'll go on now later on, once I give way to the Minister, where I think the deemed consent piece can actually diminish the culture change that we require. Minister, I'll give way. I think he actually moved on to, to where I was going to come in and, and, and interject on what he was saying. In 2016, we did start that conversation in this place when Joanne Dobson actually brought forward her bill in regards there was a structural change in the policy direction actually in regard to start those conversations. We haven't seen that increased number of donors actually coming forward onto the register that Wales now has. Wales started at a slow uh, increase in numbers, but now they've got their place far beyond where we would like to be in Northern Ireland. We had the opportunity back then to be leading on this a piece of legislation leading in the promotion and that real, real push and encouragement. And I think it goes back to what actually Peter Weir was talking about earlier on. It's about starting that conversation. This legislation has done that in many jurisdictions, in all jurisdictions, uh, in fact, across the United Kingdom as well. So it's now the, the place I think that we are. And having those two parts actually dovetailing together, the, do the, the, the conversation which brings about the, the publicity and the publication, but also that change to deem consent as well, which does have that other added impact and increase uh, of donors actually on our register. And I thank the Minister, the minister uh, for that contribution and, of course, the, the member across the way. But I am yet to be convinced that it is the deemed consent aspect of this that has actually produced results across the world, including Wales. You could argue that our publicity around it maybe isn't as good as Wales. It's not that the legislation isn't as good. It maybe could be just that it's the publicity and the way that it, that is, that it is publicised that makes the difference. And I worry. Uh, the Minister spoke in his contribution about the, the angst of family members when having to make decisions around deceased loved ones. And every single one of us should be aware and I hope no one will ever be in that position, but inevitably we know that we will be. And that decision and that conversation must be one of the most trickiest conversations, most awful conversations in the world. And I would encourage, and I would echo the Minister's words with regards to encouraging every single person out there to have a conversation with their family, in their family setting, in a comfortable place, and discuss this issue, and discuss the issue of organ donation. But I fear, with deemed consent, that that conversation can be flipped. The conversation then becomes about deemed consent and not about organ donation. And I fear that that could put many people off. 
I hope I am wrong, because I believe that this legislation will. Uh, one second, Pat. I believe that this legislation will pass this assembly, and I hope I am wrong, but I worry that I am not. I will give way to the member across the way. Member for Kevin Way, and suppose when you're on this earth as long as some of us have been in here, and I listen to your argument there on the consent principle. And on a family, uh, I think of my own sister, whose young son at 17 went out as a Duncardia with the Asseton pilgrimage to Lourdes and found himself in a terrible tragedy that cost him his life. They flew out, but Lawrence, God rest him, had already consented as a young man of 17. So he did it in the school of Gonzaga. The point I'm trying to make to you is that that made that awful tragedy and the loss of that tragedy so much simpler for my sister and my brother-in-law. Even though it was difficult, they, 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 they could see, they knew about the consent being signed. And it's a helicopter came into land at Lourdes Infirmary. They switched off that life support machine. That gave them some comfort. And that's very important that you need to take into this argument that there is comfort out there knowing that that young life lost really give and benefit so much other. And we still as a family take great comfort from that. So there should be no dispute about that whatsoever or no choices on that. It was the right choice and is the right choice. Thank you for giving way. I thank the member for his contribution and his very powerful story. And he is 100% right. Consent is good. But I have worries about deemed consent. And I've already outlined some of them with regards to the flipping of the conversation between an organ donation good, but what is this deemed consent and the confusion that that could bring and the angst to family members. And I worry about that because I want don organ donation to increase. Presumed consent or deemed consent as it's labelled in this bill is a legislative framework in which all adults living in this jurisdiction will be considered to be willing organ don donors, with the exceptions included, of course, unless they actively opt out by joining a register. That changes the default position. And by passing the bill, that would effectively decide that everyone, this Assembly who passes this bill, will effectively decide that everyone in Northern Ireland wants to don donate their organs upon death without ever asking them. That's deemed consent. Some people might be fine with that, might be okay with that, and I respect that view. But I am deeply concerned that we in this House would hold that right, and I worry. I worry also on the grounds that I don't see the evidence that it actually works. We've talked about the publicity campaigns in other places in the world. But we can also point to places where, when deemed consent was brought in, organ donations dropped. And in some cases, deemed consent was reversed in legislation. We should not ignore those aspects of this debate. No one yet has talked about a downside to deemed consent. And when we balance this issue out, we need to talk about the balance. We need to look at the pros and the cons. And again, I stress, I hope I'm wrong, but there are places close to here, France, I think, I believe, where organ donations dropped with regards to deemed consent. There is also another worry I have, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, in that when you have in place the default position of deemed consent, then it's the government deeming that consent. And there is evidence also out there that suggests when a population and a people do not trust their government, that organ donation can also drop. I would not want to be in a position where I would be relying on a trust of any executive or government, elected or otherwise, and that is correlated with organ donation. I don't want to be there. I want it to be a single issue. I want it to be a separate issue. I want it to be a life-giving gift 
from one person to another. I don't really want government involved, to be honest, in that regard. I don't want government to be deeming it that everyone wants to be an organ donator, even though I hoped and wished that they are. I can wish many things, but I don't want to presume anything. And that, why, that is why I have concerns around this bill. I thank everybody for listening to me. I suspect I am in a minority. And I also realise that there are many people out there who are struggling at this time, needing an organ. I hope and I pray that every single person on that list, over 100, gets the, do the donation and the organ that they require in order to live out their life in a fulsome manner. I hope and I pray that that is the case. And I hope and I pray that as many people as possible registers on the donor list and becomes organ donators and gives that gift of life to others. I'm not convinced that deemed consent is the way to promote that and the way to do that. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Ms. Carol McKillen. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for bringing the bill to second stage today. Um, I am going to touch upon some of the issues that Paul has raised, but I'm going to keep them um, towards the end. Uh, I mean, as we speak, there are 115 people who are waiting for a transplant. And even just reading through, Paul, and I would encourage you to read through the summary of responses to the consultation. It is very, very robust. Um, it's also completely transparent, and indeed, even as this process of the bill going through the passage of legislation, there will be other opportunities to feed in as well. But for anyone you know, who had any difficulties or doubts about what it was, certainly they, this, that bit of information would help clear it up. Um, so I suppose I'm like a lot of people. Um, so first of all, La Tawatak the town, it's a very, very important August uh, or an, an, uh, historical day for people who have been waiting on this legislation coming forward. Um, I do remember some of the difficulties around Joanne's bill. Um, and I'm pleased, and I'm sure she is, and many others, that hopefully those difficulties are resolved and we'll, we'll, we will proceed. But I'm like a lot of other people. I made my intentions known to my family many years ago that I wanted to be an organ donor in the event that something happened, but actually didn't make the step of getting on the organ donations register until 2012, March 2012, when Nula Valley, who was only 41, died. Um, Nula was mother to Rachel. She was a great daughter and a great sister. But I began to, I, I, I knew Nula because, along with many others in the Falls Women's Centre, she looked after my son and grandson in the crash, full of life, um, great person to work with kids. And then the other side, as there's many sides of us all, Danula, she was a, a very visible stalwart in Casement Park, where she you know, took money, sold programs, stewarded people, but really into games and physical fitness and activity. And very tragically, she collapsed and died. Um, but she had the foresight to make sure that she was registered on the, the organ donations register. Um, and for me, that's quite typical of a lot of people. You know, they, they want to do it. They want to do it for the right reasons. And her tragedy, her trage tragedy of Nula's life being lost actually helped aid others. And I remember even them being struck, struck enough that I got onto the, the register um, and became a, an official donor. And her death, even amongst sports, so it wasn't just about the GAA, Ulster Rugby, the IFA, and even others became involved in different campaigns of the, as they have done over a period of years. And it was great to see representatives of all those different sporting codes were in the organ donation uh, colours, they were then red, um, and encouraging people to become donors. Um, and then we had Shane Finnegan and Joe Brawley and the altruism there from Joe to Shane. And that is the case for many. I mean, I know at least two people 
who former MLAs in this chamber have become live donors to members of their families. And I know others who are uh, donors of bone marrow. Um, and they became so because they were on an official register. So eight people, I think Paul and others have said, uh, call it the gift of life, received the gift of life because of Nula Bali's wishes. And I'm sure many others will, you know, have many other experiences of people in their constituencies, of people that they know of. So for me, you know, the, everyone who, most people who in this consultation agree that, um, that there does need to be legislation around organ donation. Um, it will also put this on a statutory footing, which I think has been missing. And that's where, so for example, some of the issues that Paul had raised, I mean, I think the, from what I heard, and I'm willing to give way, but I think it's unfortunate to use the concerns around de con, you know, deemed consent, along with perhaps a, a view that you hold around interference from government, because I've heard that from you around other issues. But the issue for deemed consent is an important one, because people need to know where the differences are and what decision it will make with clinicians and families and individuals through this bill need this legislation in order to make their work a lot clearer. The official uh, organ donation register is there, but it's only one indication. Um, and I, I would surely. Yeah, I think, uh, this has been a very, very good debate so far, can I say that, with regards to all the members who have taken place. But when you talk about clinicians needing legislation in place to make their jobs clearer. I'm not sure that deemed consent does that because of the issue around the conversation that will still be had by family members and clinicians around the time of the, around the, the real grave pressurized uh, trauma of a death. Um, and I'm not sure it makes it clear. It makes it clear that it's deemed consent, and it makes it clear, clear that we're all on the register until we opt out. But I'm not sure it helps the clinicians at all with regards to organ donation. Thank you. And I appreciate the member for clarifying that position. Um, and I intend to keep this a good-hearted debate. I mean, these chambers are for agreement and disagreement, and provide people for an opportunity to outline what their position is. But clinicians have consistently said that when, and particularly the specialists that they are, the compassion that they have, the gift that they have in order to give life to others, when they're telling us over a period of years that there, there, there is uncertainty and it needs cleared up and it needs cleared up through legislation, then who are we to disagree? But again, um, that's, that's what this place is, is for. Um, I do think, um, I mean, the, one of the testimonies I mean, I've heard other people, including the surgeon this morning, but one of the things, and he too repeated this, that transplants, despite everything that's happened throughout COVID, have continued to go ahead, albeit with periods where it was not safe to do so. Um, but the issue for us, in terms of our, our health and social care, we are in a crisis at the minute, an absolute crisis. And we need to see further investment coming from the British government to the Department of Health and this executive in order to address that. That, that isn't me being political, that's a fact. The Minister has said it himself. Um, we also need to look at, so for example, a service like transplant service that has continued throughout this pandemic, but the issue that keeps coming back to us as a health committee and indeed as MLAs are life-saving operations that have had to be cancelled because of COVID rates and infections. So when COVID rates and infections surge, it puts pressure on the capacity of our hospitals, particularly our intensivists, to deal with it. And anyone coming out of an operation for a transplant needs those intensivists. So that's the decisions that people are making. And I would use this opportunity to urge people not only to get vaccinated to help themselves, to help their families, but certainly protect these others these other surgeries that are, that are needed. But the issue for me is that unless there is a change in trajectory in terms of the COVID virus, 
In addition to the crisis that we have within health and social care, the COVID's further exposed, as well as health and social care staff telling us that they're now implementing their winter surge plans, which, Minister, we haven't seen yet. We've seen the COVID recovery plans, but we haven't seen the winter surge plans. But already we know that gaps within health and social care staff that were there before COVID have been exacerbated now because staff are burnt out. They're working, living, <laughs> operating on fumes. The tank is empty and they're given and given and given again. And these staff who work in transplants are supportive of the, everyone else and vice versa. So I do appreciate that this is really, really important, but it would be an absolute sin if this legislation went through, if more awareness was created, if even more living donors were to, to give, do we have the capacity? Because as we are sitting currently, we are under huge pressure within health and social care. But anyway, certainly. I thank the member for giving way. And I think this could be a very, very positive point. And I'm going to rely on the minister here and his knowledge, and I hope that he'll be able to contribute later on with regards to this. But as far as I know, we have a very good high rate of living donation, uh, and it should be something that should be applauded. The minister might contradict me later on, but I hope that's not the case, and I hope that is true. And if it is, I think it's something that we should all be very proud of in Northern Ireland. Well, my, my understanding is we do have a very high rate, but the minister, and I'm sure his officials will also tell you, that um, in relation to the staff and the intensivists and the cap capacity and the sites in order to carry out these life-saving operations, they need to be protected. They also need to be invested upon and done so on a consistent basis. And if any of that, part of that jigsaw is missing or under pressure, then it does have an impact on it, so, on it all. So it's absolutely the right thing that we're doing, bringing this bill forward. Um, I'm sure Dahi, Marcin and Seth and many, many others. Uh, and I also want to thank the British and Irish Heart Foundations for the, um, the information that they brought forward and have consistently brought forward. I also want to make a point, and I suppose Robbie made a political point earlier, and again, this is a political chamber, but it would be absolutely inexcusable if this bill didn't see the full passage because people felt that this institution wasn't where they wanted to be. I have to say that. Uh, Robbie made it in terms of the two big parties, and I suppose that's a go-to place for parties who aren't in Sinn Féin or the DUP. But at this stage, we need to ensure not only does this bill survive the passage and get through, and these institutions are here in order to ensure that that happens. But we also need to ensure that the families out there watching and listening to this have confidence in us to do our very, very best, not only to pass this, but other pieces of legislation that are out there waiting. But we also need to get the money. We need to get the money to help our health and social care system that is in absolute crisis, because we've now got the winter pressures on top of everything else. And we need to get the money from the British Treasury to give to health and social care, and we need to make sure that it helps people in most need. And I, along with many others, have consistently pointed out that when it comes to keeping people well, keeping them safe and keeping them alive, they have no further to look at what our hospitals and our GPs and our ODRs and our nurses and all those people, every one of them involved in health and social care, uh, they need, they don't need anything other than our support and they also need that to be emotional, political and financial. So I support this second stage of the, the bill and I look forward to further debates and this going through its full passage. Mr Mark Durkham. Thank you Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I welcome the chance to speak on this important piece of legislation. It's a bill that won't only change lives, but it will literally save lives and will no doubt be of incalculable value for many families, so many families, who have fought tirelessly to see the North implement this soft out organ donation system in line with those already in operation. 
in England, Scotland and Wales. At this point, I'd like to congratulate the tireless campaigners who have worked so hard to see this bill introduced into our Assembly. Of course, no discussion on organ donation in the North would be complete without paying tribute, as others already have, to young Dahi McGowan, who has been waiting almost four years for the gift of a new heart. Dahi's parents, Saif and Marcin, have never led up in their campaign to raise awareness of and change the law here on organ donation. Many of others have done so much to raise awareness too, and I'd like to pay tribute uh, to the family of a young Belfast woman, Rachel Malloy, whose aunt will be known to many of you, Catherine Matthews. She works upstairs for the SDLP. Rachel was 22 and full of life and passed away suddenly earlier this year. Fortunately, she was able to give the gift of life to others. And donation, it's not just about what you can give, it's also about uh, what you can get. Some consolation at a time of massive loss. This legislation is long overdue and will lead to many more lives being saved. As the previous speaker said, there are presently 125 people on the organ transplant waiting list here. That's 125 individuals and their families waiting desperately for news that a suitable donor has been found. So why is action needed now? Research from the British Heart Foundation has highlighted that over 90% of citizens here support organ donation, yet only 50% have registered their interest on the NHS organ donation register. And while I recognise that a great deal of effort has been made by the PHA and others to improve public awareness and encourage people to take time and talk about their wishes with their loved ones should the unthinkable happen. The reality is that many of these decisions ultimately go unregistered. And every year in the North, on average, 14 people pass away awaiting transplant. Bearing this in mind, the logical next step in our view, is the move towards a soft opt-out organ donation scheme, whereby under this proposed bill would assume that everyone is willing to donate unless they express otherwise or formally opt out. This proposal and the inclusion of consultation with family members taking into account their faith and beliefs, I believe, ensures that this legislation is as sensitive and person-centred as it needs to be. It is not a move that needs to be regarded with fear or apprehension, but rather one that does ensure that individual beliefs remain an integral cog in the process. It is clear that this legislation calls not just for a changing of hearts, but of minds and culture. However, we have borne witness to a palpable shift in attitudes within the past few years, again thanks in the main part to families coming forward willing to share their first-hand experience of uh, organ transplant waiting lists. In doing so, they forced people, many of us, to imagine life in their shoes, uh, even for the briefest of moments, causing us to re-evaluate our choices and to open dialogue around organ donation, a conversation that might not have taken place or might not have even been considered otherwise. And that's all any of us can ask, all that this legislation can ask, to call on people to think about their choice, to give the gift of life. There's no more time to waste. This bill must be progressed as quickly as possible through the Assembly so we can change the lives of families everywhere in Northern Ireland who have been waiting far too long for this life-saving system. And I certainly uh, concur with the comments of the previous speaker on the importance of a functioning assembly to uh, deliver this and many other pieces of important legislation. We were without uh, decision-making or legislative powers for three years. Who, God knows how far behind we are already, and we can't afford to fall further behind. Thank you. I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. Uh, and show on you, such as uh, I welcome the opportunity to speak here today uh, on this uh, bill. 
I don't intend to speak for too long, but I think it is important, and almost all speakers have made reference to the McGann family, to Marching and Seth and their, their son Dahi. Uh, and I first came into contact with the family a few years ago. They live in my own constituency in, in West Belfast. And over the past number of years, they have traveled far and wide uh, and met many people uh, from all perspectives to raise awareness uh, of organ donation. Uh, Robbie Butler has already referenced the large number of people that they met. I mean, I went, actually went to Leinster House with them to meet the then Health Minister, Simon Harris, and I was also at the event that Robbie mentioned himself in the City Hall. Uh, when Deirdre Hargey, as mayor, held a reception there for uh, the British Heart Foundation. And of course, the star performer there was young Dahi. And uh, Dahi also attends the same school that my two daughters were at. Um, so I bump into him and to the rest of the family uh, regularly. And I mean, I remember Marching telling me when uh, Dahi's condition was diagnosed and the family were told that he needed a new heart. Uh, he immediately set about, uh, he, he almost became obsessed with the issue of, of organ donation, did a massive amount of research into it and decided not, not in a selfish way to try and get uh, you know, a donation for Dahi, although of course the family wants that obviously but also about raising in general uh, the awareness, public awareness about, uh, about organ donation. And I mean, I think everyone who has met the family or who is aware of them will agree that they have done an immense job in raising public awareness uh, about uh, organ donation and they should be commended for that. Uh, I also want to say that uh, it was my intention at one stage during this mandate to bring forward uh, a private member's bill on organ donation. Thankfully, the minister stepped in and decided to bring forward his own bill, and I, wa I want to uh, commend him for that. Um, and I suppose uh, it has been mentioned by a number of speakers, the elephant in the room is um, whether these institutions will remain in place for long enough for this legislation to get through. And a number of speakers have also referenced organ donation as being uh, a gift for life. And, that, and that's what it is. And we know that people on the, organ, on the waiting list for organ donation will die. Uh, young Dahi is stable at the minute. Um, it's his fifth birthday next month. He, he's been waiting three years now, or he has been three years on the waiting list, and his condition is stable, but that could change, that could change in the morning. Uh, and there's no guarantee that there will be a new heart there for him when he really, really needs it. Uh, and, and, and I would say to those uh, who uh, may uh, in, in some uh, moments of reflection, think about that gift of life and how important it is, not just to Dahi McGann and his families, but to all those families uh, waiting for organ donation and on the waiting list. And, and think about that when they're making decisions about whether these institutions should continue uh, or not. Uh, and I leave it on that. Um, I do agree uh, that it's not just um, the, the change of uh, change to a soft opt-out organ donation that's required. We do also need uh, a publicity campaign to run in tandem along with that. And we also, on an individual level, need to communicate our views to our families. All of those things uh, go together uh, and in the time ahead and hopefully we get this legislation through, I'm sure the Minister will take account of all of those things as well. Thank you. I call Mr Morris Bradley. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, 
I wasn't going to speak on this here, but listening to the debate I decided to. Uh, it's a very emotive topic, uh, and a good healthy debate has taken place so far in this bill. I am an organ donor, uh, and I have been for a long number of years. It is something I made a conscious decision uh, to do during my 20s, uh, and something I have maintained ever since. I still carry an organ donor card. My family are aware I am a donor, and if any of my organs may help another needing a donor organ, organ which could be a matter of life and death to them, or could help their quality of life, then I would like to think that some of my organs could have, have been benefit to them. I would appeal to people in this chamber throughout Northern Ireland who are in good health to think about becoming an organ donor. It is the right thing to do. I believe in it, and I believe in it passionately. None of us know what tomorrow may bring, but if in death I can help a life, it is a choice I believe is worth making. My signing up for organ donation was a very personal decision I took when it was a little known thing to do and not fashionable. So I had appealed for better education around becoming a donor. I believe in it. I support it. I would love to see an increase in people choosing to become organ donors. It was my choice, and I believe in choice. And I would like to see better education around the benefits of becoming an organ donor. In, if in a life a death can be maintained, then, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I think it is worth it. But it has to be a choice. Mr. Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, this is the result of a long campaign of a number of hugely dedicated individuals who have put their life and soul into bringing forward the change in law in Northern Ireland, with widespread public support for change and increase in those choosing to be on the register across the UK and Northern Ireland being the only place in the UK without a deemed consent system. The time is now to get this legislation passed as soon as possible, and thank you, Minister, for bringing this forward. Um, I know other members have stated here how important this legislation has passed, some calling it the elephant in the room. Uh, I was elected here. Um, just about four years ago, and for three years I sat empty. I, not my choice, it was forced upon me. And there's a lot of legislation here being passed in this chamber, and there's a lot of private members' bills coming through here before we finish this mandate. And I ask those to think long and hard. Those who pulled it down before, threatened to pull it down, it's about working together and trying to get this legislation through. I'm not going to give a lecture to anyone. Just think long and hard before anyone does any reckless decisions. We currently have 115 people on the waiting lists. That's 115 lives we can directly save by passing this legislation. This is a situation which unfortunately happened every year here. Eleven people on the transfer list lost their lives in 2020. We have gone through 18 months of an imaginable loss, but those are the 11 lives that could have been saved here if we would have brought this legislation forward. An opt-out system could directly help 180 people a year and would boost our overall consent rate to hopefully achieve the gold standard rate of 80 per cent. Our rate of consent has not moved significantly in years. We must act now, folks. I would like to congratulate the tireless campaigners who have worked so hard to see this bill introduced into the Assembly. It is on us now to knuckle down and get it passed. And if I could say, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, this is the job we are elected to do. We are not elected to squabble over nonsense. We are elected to make decisions and pass legislation that will improve, and in this case, saves people's lives. More of this, please, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Mr. Jerry Carroll. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thought there were more people before me, but happy to speak, obviously. Um, happy to speak in favour of this bill, and I think it's long uh, overdue that there was simple, easy to follow legislation around organ donation. And too often, when it comes to issues that may be difficult to discuss uh, or talk about, and people don't know how to approach or raise them. So I think in that context, there, uh, where there is no reason or need uh, for exemptions, and the state should make the assumption uh, that it is right and proper to proceed with organ donation. Uh, in the last year and a half, people have taken extraordinary measures um, for each other, uh, for each other's public health. Uh, this legislation is in a similar vein in, in my and other people's view. Uh, it indicates quite strongly that our family members faced with a tragedy and an untimely death uh, can play an important role in giving hope and life to others. 
to me, this is a strong uh, and powerful thing uh, in and of itself, and a, an incredible act of solidarity, uh, um, and worth uh, emphasizing, and uh, in, in and of itself, a reason to support the bill. Uh, in passing, some years ago, um, similar to Carl Lee Cullen, uh, I raised the issue of organ donation uh, with family members, and that I would gladly wish. Um, that my organs would be donated. I'm sure others have had that conversation uh, casually, uh, off the cuff uh, chats with loved ones. But it wasn't, to be honest, until I seen uh, the campaign led by uh, Dahi, uh, Marching, and Seth that I actually made the decision, uh, along with many other thousands of people. And uh, I'm happy to say, uh, Anish is jumped on me. Um, so that, that campaign really led to me and many other people uh, signing up to be organ donors. And I, th I think it really goes to show you how uh, change is made in this society, because to put it mildly, uh, this house moves often at a snail's pace, uh, and it is those campaigns out in communities and streets that forces issues uh, onto the agenda. And, and in that vein, I want to pay tribute to uh, those campaigners, including especially uh, we die, uh, Seth, uh, and, and Marching. It goes to show really how change comes about. Uh, and it's those campaigns, those conversations and activism that really cause uh, the change and cause those conversations to happen uh, in workplaces, amongst families, amongst friends and so on and so forth. Uh, the past year there's been obviously a lot of discussion about COVID and medical evidence guide discussions being taken or not by ministers. And whilst there have been a handful of people claiming um, to be acting on medical or scientific advice, disputing the real dangers of COVID, there's been overwhelming consensus uh, for the most part uh, at least probably 90 per cent, the governments need to take action uh, around COVID. COVID is a, a threat to public health. And I think it's similar in this, uh, this issue, separate issue, but there's a similar point guiding it. Uh, and as I understand it, there's pretty much medical unanimity uh, across the field around organ donation legislation uh, being uh, not only required, but being essential to increase the possibility of donation for so many uh, people. As I understand it, uh, the clinical lead for organ donation here uh, is in support uh, of legislation for soft opt-out uh, legislation. Uh, and too many people, unfortunately, uh, have the conversation uh, at a late stage when loved ones are, are, are dying uh, or unfortunately uh, have passed away. Um, and if there are strong reasons for, for opt-out, they can obviously do so. Um, and there are, there are ethical reasons, I'll be honest, I don't fully understand them, but there are, there are ethical reasons for opposing it, but there's uh, support there for people to do so. Uh, and the argument uh, around, yeah, so I think it's important that we, we do so. And in some cases, there, there, there's opposition, the reason that they oppose the state for taking uh, strong measures. The state tries to grab power for its own interests, to harass, to intimidate, to persecute persecute people, to spy on citizens, citizens and so on and so forth. And in those cases, there should be opposition to the state getting more powers, but this is not what this is about. This is about giving support, hope, as people have said, to uh, individuals and to take a public health measure policy to support uh, people who need organ donation. So for those reasons, I don't buy the so-called libertarian argument. I mean, where does it stop? Do you oppose arguments around uh, legislation around road safety, uh, around health and safety legislation? Uh, around medical interventions in the hospital, unless there's full consent, whatever that is. Uh, so I think there's uh, important arguments that need to be challenged in that regard. Uh, those myths need to be dispelled, uh, and I think we need to see this bill uh, proceed as quickly as possible, and therefore happy to support it uh, today and going forward. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mrs Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm very pleased to be able to participate in this uh, discussion and debate and I would want to give my full uh, support. And in, in doing so, I would want to uh, pay tribute to all those tireless campaigners who have uh, uh, brought us to this stage, and none uh, less so than my own uh, constituency, former colleague Joanne Dobson and party colleague of the Minister, a former MLA of this House, who was passionate about this issue because she has very familiar family uh, and is a kidney donor herself for her own son and I want to pay tribute to her. She worked for many years and unfortunately isn't here today to see it uh, hopefully going through the House. Uh, but as my colleague Pat Catney said, and I heard uh, Mr Sheehan's contribution uh, uh, 
saying to the DUP about the threat to pull down the House and what that might do to this legislation. But I must say it's a bit rich coming from that quarter, given that the bill could have been before the House some three years ago, presumably. And indeed, uh, there was a threat not three or four months ago from the same quarter to pull down the House further. So Sinn Féin and the DUP must look very closely at themselves uh, in terms of uh, what they do for their own selfish political interest and that which needs to be done for the greater uh, common good. Um, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I wanted uh, also to pay tribute at this stage uh, to the family of Rachel Malloy. Rachel Malloy was a 22-year-old final student doing her teaching cert. She is the niece uh, of Catherine Matthews. Many of, of uh, you will know Catherine uh, is uh, our party manager here uh, and administrator uh, in the offices at Stormont. And Rachel was a much-loved uh, niece, and she died tragically. Uh, on the 27th of March from a blood clot and she, her family who are grieving her uh, tremendously are comforted in the knowledge uh, that her decision and, and she made it known within the family that she would want to be uh, a donor. She has given new life and new hope to three other people by the donation of her liver and kidneys. A man in his 40s, a woman in her 40s and a young boy have all benefited and there is no doubt uh, that their life has changed and has been enhanced by the bravery of the Malloy family and I pay tribute to her parents Paul and Jacqueline for having the courage to fulfil uh, Rachel's wishes and I will. I, I welcome the remarks of the, uh, there is I think an old saying I don't know what, what culture it is, but that you're only truly dead when the lives that you, that you have touched in your lifetime uh, are also dead. And is it not, not particularly shown by the issue of organ donation, where actually in that case we see lives living on uh, through organ donation, which, which otherwise would have been cut short? Um, thank you uh, for that intervention, Mr Weir. Um, I think that is what has brought much comfort to those that are still very much grieving the loss of such a young person but whenever they know that others have been able to live a much fuller and higher quality life, it doesn't take away the pain, but it helps them to cope better and in their pride in, in, in their loved one and the courageous decision that they made in the tragedy that they themselves had to face through accident or injury. And uh, I pay tribute to all of them. So, Minister, I do hope that this bill goes through. It's certainly needed. It's certainly something which has the full-hearted support of the SDLP. Call Mrs. Joanne Bunting. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm hopeful that I can retain my composure in this. Um, it's not an easy subject. It's highly emotive, highly sensitive, and as all members have said, literally boils down to life and death for people. And it's heartbreaking to hear the personal stories and to have those brought to your attention. And for an awful lot of people, this is a head and heart call, and it's really tough. And my starting point is that I carry a card. I'm on the register. Mm -hmm. But like Paul, I'm cautious. And I think that there's many things in this house about this around which we can entirely unite. And that is, we want as many people as possible on that donor register. We want a huge awareness campaign that brings it to people's attention, that allows for a conversation about what happens around death, dying, and donation. And I think that, I suppose, it's important to reiterate then that those of us who do have some concerns, those concerns aren't based around that. We're all coming to this with an open heart and the best of intentions with a view to increasing the numbers. So I'm grateful to members for the respectful debate that there's been. And I trust that members will understand that for some of us, um, it's not easy, and it's not about obstruction, um, but what the state 
and the power of the state, what, the, what right the state has over our bodies is not a small thing for many of us. And absolutely rightly, people have sacrificed much over this past 18 months for the sake of others. And I have no doubt that many people who, are, who have concerns in this regard still will sacrifice much for the safety of others, still are on the register, still want to see those numbers increase and people willing to donate. So that, that's not what it is. It's just that I think it's important that it's on the record for the House. It's not an easy position for people to come to for deemed consent. It's a big step for any country. Not, not a decision to be taken lightly. Not one necessarily to be ultimately and finally and without giving consideration to our thoughtfulness on the issue versus our emotions on the issue. And so, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I have concerns about what it means and where it goes. But in so doing, I support donation. And I want to be very clear that as we go forward in this debate to the next stages, which are inevitable, that those who express concern are not doing so from a position of not supporting the register and a campaign and all of those things. And I think it's important that we don't lose sight of that. The views that are held are held so strongly and from genuine positions of freedoms and liberties in society and the power of the state. And those are not small things. I'll give way first to Mr Free and then I'll give way to Mr Carroll. The member for giving way and, and I appreciate her thoughts and words on this uh, which are considered. Uh, I, I agree with her that we all here I believe in this chamber are seeking solutions and whilst the jury is still out and there's no proof around deemed consent and its effectiveness, what we do know through evidence throughout the world is that public awareness and specialised nurses are the key drivers of organ donation and that's what we should be trying to do to encourage that and to promote that as public awareness and specialist nurses who are well trained in order to get uh, people convinced around organ donation and that's the solutions that I believe this House seeks. Thank you. I absolutely concur um, with Mr Frew, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker and I'll give way to Mr Carroll. I and listen to her carefully, but I, I feel I have to point out an inconsistency. I think there's a bit of a pick and mix approach uh, because the party is obviously quite content with heavily regulating women's health care. No issue at all with that. And then when it comes to this issue, uh, the party seems that. Order. Uh, Order. Same, same issue. The debate should refer to the content of the bill. I have been, I've been very broad in my interpretations, and members have on occasion veered far from the content of the bill, but if we could keep our remarks to the content of the bill, I think Mrs Bunting got the point that you were making. Mrs Bunting. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I did get the point, um, and I'm glad that you brought it to order. I don't want this to degenerate into that conversation. I really don't. And I, I don't think the, the principle that I take on either of those issues is inconsistent. Um, because for me, Life is precious, always, and that's why I'm on the register, because life is precious from whenever it begins, and that's the subject of debate. But no, I just wanted to be very clear, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker to this House, that for those of us who are struggling with this, and that's what it is, I want to be clear and have it on the record that it is not about opposing the conversation. It is not about opposing um, donation. It is about whether or not the state has rights over our bodies. And ultimately, I think some of us need to, to better understand or to be convinced of the merits 
the current position is that a family, if you're, on the, if you're on the register, your next of kin can still say no. And that position remains the case with deemed consent. And I think people need to understand the distinctions and the differences if ultimately the position doesn't change at the point at which a decision needs to be made. So those are my thoughts, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I trust that the House will bear in mind you know, whenever the time comes, that that is where some of us are coming from. Thank you. Mr. Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Ulster Unionist Party fully supports moving towards a soft opt-out system, and I'm glad to see the Minister delivering on one of our very important manifesto commitments. The tragic reality is Northern Ireland now has the most outdated organ donation system in the United Kingdom. That didn't need to be the case. Joanne Dobson's private member's bill, which proposed that everyone should be on the organ donation register unless they took a simple step of opting out, was blocked disappointingly by some parties in this chamber at the last moment. Wales already had a system in place. We'd come from very much the same side of the argument as the member, but factually, in relation to that, uh, Mrs. Dobson's bill passed through this House at second reading. It was then at the point at which clinicians raised considerable concerns in relation to the contents of this. There was no further vote on it. Mrs Dobson then withdrew the bill. Thank you for that. Um, but uh, there was uh, understandable and significant anger across charities, patients, groups and campaigners in 2016 at the decision to, uh, for Joanne to have to be forced to withdraw her bill. As a result, Northern Ireland has since gone from once being a trace blazer on organ donation laws to now having the most archaic system anywhere in the United Kingdom and Ireland. This bill will put that right. Organ donation saves lives. Increasing the rate of organ donation would allow our medical staff to save even more in, here in Northern Ireland. Organ donation is one of the most selfless acts of kindness one person can do for another. Whilst it continues to have strong public support, unfortunately, there remains a shortfall between the number of donors and the actual number of organs needed each year. Whilst public support for organ donation across Northern Ireland remains high, around 90%, just over 40% of the local population are actually on the organ donor register. Around 14 people tragically pass away each year on the waiting list. Lives are needlessly been lost. As of uh, June 1, 2021, there were 125 people waiting for an organ transplant in Northern Ireland, 16 of whom are waiting on a new heart. This is a huge number of people who could not only have their quality of life drastically improved, but could also have a better outlook in terms of their life expectancy. The soft opt-out scheme is not going to legally tie everyone into having their organs harvest if they omit it to opt-out. The final decision in this will be made by the close family of the potential donor, and they are the best placed people to know what the donor would have wished. When a family loses a loved one, especially when they are young, the only comfort they have left behind about the life of the deceased is the memories of family holidays and occasions, as well as perhaps academic, sporting and workplace achievements of their loved ones. In many cases, when a family have lost a member, especially when the circumstances of their death are not only sudden, unexpected and tragic, you will hear parents sadly, but with a quiet sense of pride, announce that the organs of their loved ones has given both hope and life to a number of other families who had a family member waiting for a transplant. This must surely be a point of comfort for the family of the, the donor to know that their loss has given others hope. Mr Cagney, with his intervention earlier, uh, uh, did, did explain in his family the comfort that that did give. I hope that this bill can become law within this mandate. We owe it to all those patiently waiting for a transplant that will change their lives dramatically to ensure this happens after a timely due process and the scrutiny of this assembly. It is a fact, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, that any delays in delivering this bill could unfortunately cause lives. Is there anything more important than preserving life. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, members. As question time begins at 2 p.m., uh, I suggest that the House will take its ease until then. When we return to this matter, the next speaker is the Minister for Health. Members take their ease for a few moments. Members, we now return to the debate on the second stage of the organ and tissue donation deemed consent bill. And we're now at a stage where I invite the Minister of Health, Robin Swan, to conclude and wind up the debate on the uh, issue. Um, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I, I do want to thank everybody who has contributed uh, to the debate at second stage um, today. I think it is unfortunate, Mr Deputy Speaker, that that, that flow from the debate earlier on um, this morning has been broken up by question time, but that, that's part of the business of this House, because I think the, the debate that we were having the conversations that have been made around the chamber are reflective of those conversations that have been had since this legislation was first even muted back in 2016 by, by my then party colleague Joanne Dobson and the conversations that have been going on since. But I think it's clear from today's debate that there is an agreement that after considering the growing evidence base and the strong public support for the introduction of this legislation, I think we can leave no doubt that this is the right time for the Northern, Northern Ireland uh, Assembly to implement uh, this bill. And I would like to take just some time just to, to respond to comments made by, by members earlier this morning. Um, uh, in opening, I want to thank the, the Chair for the com of the Committee uh, for their contributions and the work that has been going on since this was first muted in this mandate. And I thank him and the Speaker's Office for the close work and, uh, on this issue that we've been able to get to this stage. And I look forward to that further positive engagement as we move through committee stage and other stages of this legislation. Um, the, when speaking then uh, as uh, the Sinn Féin health spokesman, uh, uh, the member then spoke about the delay and the opportunity that had been lost. What I would say, Mr Deputy Speaker, to those uh, who have participated in where we are now, and that's the, let's take the opportunity that we have. We've got this bill to its second stage, so let's move and make sure it gets to the committee stage and through all the other legislative processes while it still um, has the opportunity to do, to do that. Uh, the Vice Chair of, of the Health Committee, Ms Pam Cameron, uh, when she spoke, made, she, she, you know, she, she opened her comments by uh, saying she was speaking on her own behalf, uh, but then went on to reiterate the, the clarity that this chamber is the place for that debate. And I think when I reflect on the conversations that I had with, with the Deputy First Minister in progressing um, this bill out of the executive to second stage, to first stage to second stage to get it here, it was exactly that argument that we were making. If there are those who still want to have the conversation, those who want to get that more information uh, and have a wider debate, this is the place to have it. And also through the committee stage that we go to now. So, it's about taking that, 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 that place that we have now in this, this point in time that we have now. And, and Peter Weir, uh, and I acknowledged this earlier, I think when I was responding to Paul in regards to, to Peter's contribution, one of the things that this bill has allowed us to do is actually to start to have that conversation uh, in regards to what organ donation actually means and how, the, how it can be promoted, how it should be promoted. Um, but I think just, just reflecting, I think it w w was Paul's comments and maybe some of the other DUP colleagues in the House in regards about having the conversation, explaining to people. That's where we were in 2016. That was the counter proposal that came forward uh, and was accepted and taken forward by, by this House in regards to what could be done with Joanne's bill, in regards to wider publication, wider publicising of, of the conversation around organ donation. Um, it hasn't got us to where we need to be. And I think that's, that's that standard of 80% um, of actually organ, don organ donors registers. So it is about taking this to the next step. That's what this piece of legislation is about. It brings us into line with Wales, Scotland, England as well. And I think the evidence is there when you look at the Welsh numbers in regards to how that slow conversation and how moving into 10% actually increased the number of potential donors. Um, and he has sat and listened to the whole debate. Uh, but he talks about the conversation. But the conversation, even with his colleague Joanne Dobson's bill, was convoluted along con deemed consent. Whereas, really, a publicity campaign should be all about organ donation. 
and the positives and the gift of life that that presents. But if you haven't consented, it's very hard to present it as a gift. And that conversation then changes when it's wrapped up in deemed consent. And it can distort the conversation to that point. So I believe the Welsh model, the, the publicity in Wales is of a different scale to anything that we have ever talked about or anything that we have ever ran in this department in this country with regards to promotion of organ donation. And if that was set in train, I believe organ donations and people registering to go on the organ don at the nation register would be mighty and be far greater than it is currently. Thank you. I thank the member. You know, and I get where he's coming from in the argument, but I think that wait and see position uh, doesn't get us to where we need to be. With 115 people on the, the organ donor register waiting at this minute in time, uh, with the, the possibility that every year around 10 to 15 people in Northern Ireland will die waiting on an organ transplant, I think, as I said in my opening comments, now is the right time to move into that, that sphere of, not, of having the conversation, as I said to him earlier on, in the debate of dovetailing the conversation, the promotion, along with the legislation. And, and I do note, I think it was Paula Bradshaw who said, you know, about that year. And I think that's why we take that year, to have that conversation. So we move away from simply deemed consent, but also move into promotion as well, so that that's, that space is there to have those, those conversations. But just looking to the, the promotional activity in regards to that, between August 2020 and September 21, there has already been, uh, I, I think, uh, a start at the, that development. We've established a network development of partners and stakeholders with that wider wider collaborative approach, uh, adopting uh, the ability to amplify organ donation messaging, and that has been actually key to, to enhancing the promotion. Uh, key partners in that uh, have been charities, trusts, local councils, uh, who are extremely supportive and proactive. Network development has also been aug augmented promotion in other sectors, such as the voluntary community sector, schools, further and higher education, and our business community. Our voluntary and community partnership work and actually allows us as a department to reach a wide range of organisations, groups and target audiences as the grassroots of our society. And that, is, that has actually included faith, uh, BAME and younger and older, older audiences. But there is already you know, promotional activity, uh, future plans in, in place in regards to no matter where this bill goes, and I do hope it gets to, to the next stage and actually gets to legislative consent, but that, that on, ongoing drive uh, keeps going. And that's key to connecting and engaging with audiences uh, because real life people faces stories uh, are very powerful. And we heard that from a number of members around the House today who actually brought uh, to reality what it means not just to be an organ donor, but what it means for the family as well when you know a deceased relative or someone who passes away is able to give that that that, that gift of life that organ donation brings. But it's how we take this um, to, to the next step as well. So, uh, just looking around and some of the other comments, you know, in regards to Cara Hunter's contribution from the SDLP, and I think that was reflective uh, from all the SDLP contributions uh, from Pat Catney, from Mark Durgan, and Dolores Kelly, it was very much about that personal experience and what it meant for them as individuals, but also through, through the connections with, with the party connection in regards to the niece of their party manager, Catherine, and what that meant to, to them as a family. And that's that's where we start, I suppose, the crux of this conversation. Uh, Robbie Butler um, actually referenced, you know, the work that had been done and where it started. This had started with, with her party colleague, uh, then Joanne Dobson. Um, I, I spoke to Joanne this morning in regards to where we were going, uh, and again, very emotional in this because of not just that interest at that point in time as a politician, but also as a mother, and also then eventually actually as a living donor in regards to what organ transplant, transplantation actually means and the benefit that it actually brings. So um, when a lot of members as well then spoke about, you know, young Dachy uh, McGachan and his family in regards to Marcin and Seth and the work that they have done really promoting uh, organ donation over the past few years. And I don't think anybody in this house could be in any doubt or haven't seen the publication and the advertising campaign that they have put forward um, as a family. Because I can assure this house, like Marjean, like Seth, as a parent of a child with a congenital heart defect, um, and I think it was Pat said it when he was talking to, to the family, that, you know, Dachy's stable now, 
but it's what could progress, what could develop in months and years. And see the reassurance of not even a young child, but of anybody at any stage in life, knowing that there is a potential of a donor being there, is a reassurance, and it's the hope that Robbie Butler actually spoke about as well, that this legislation, this piece of legislation actually brings. So it's about that next step that we go into, and it's about the conversations that can be had and will be had around many dinner tables as to what this means and what people want to actually engage with. I think Paula Bradshaw and her, her, her contribution, I, I think, finished with two questions. I think one of answered, and that was in regards to the promotional activity that we have done and can do. The other one was, uh, why has it taken this assembly so long to actually get here? And I think that is a question that has been asked by many campaigners, many families, and many people who have been waiting to get to this point. But we're here today, we're at second stage, and I look forward to engaging with, with the Health Committee and those other, those other stakeholders that need that additional step to get this, this piece of legislation moving on. Uh, to Anya Murphy and her maiden speech, uh, I welcome Anya uh, to the House. Uh, she raises, um, I think, as, as every member of Fermanagh South Tyrone, of, of uh, that ask for equity for her constituency. And I can assure you that this legislation will apply equally to everybody across Northern Ireland, not just about where they sit on the organ donation list, but where they actually then fit into our organ donation scheme and that's being able to receive uh, that gift of, a, of, a, of an organ should they be deemed clinically fit and should that match be found. In regards to, um, in, in regards to Carl McCullen's comments, uh, in regards, I know Carl's not in, in the House, but Carl spoke of the need of this legislation and to move uh, to place this actually in a statutory footing. And that's what we've seen in England, Scotland and Wales, and we've seen the difference that it has already made on the, on the Welsh uh, donor register and the effect it is having in regards to that. England and Scotland are still in that implementation and advancement of, I suppose, having that conversation to be moved there. Carl also raised and what is a, a realistic challenge um, at this point in time, and that's where our health service is still currently under intense pressure due to COVID and what we're working through. Uh, just to give uh, the member, I know she's not here, but she will be listening, an update on our renal transplant programme. Uh, and it's the fact that the Belfast Trust has confirmed uh, to me that the backlog of transplant waiters, which had occurred when the service was paused, has been cleared uh, with the exception of two patients, and they're assessed as currently unsuitable for transplant. Uh, and for additional further information, over the period from the 3rd of March to the 9th of August, the Belfast Trust actually carried out 26 live donor and 22 deceased donor transplants, and they were averaging 3.4 uh, transplantations per week. So that work uh, has started again, and it is ongoing. Um, Carl, and, and again, she, she quoted myself uh, back to me a number of times, which can be dangerous in this place, but it is in, in regard to the need for, for financing and support uh, the financial support that my, my department needs. It's not just about the money, but the money will be useful and it is needed. And that ask, you know, for the British uh, government, the British Exchequer, actually, to supply that money to our health service. Uh, the Barnet consequential is there. Uh, I, I'm made aware it will be transferred to the executives. I suppose my ask to Carl then is to speak to, to the finance minister to make sure whatever Barnet consequential comes from that, that it is also ring fenced and supplied to health in regards to what we need to do and what we can do. I think Mark Durkin, and expanding that point that, that Carl was making about the need to move this from uh, legis need to move this into legislation and put it on a statutory footing, is really about those people who say they want to be an organ donor, they should be, but have never quite got round to it. So that's why you know surveys show that up to ninety percent of people say yes, I want to be an organ donor, I, I you know that's what I want to do but only 46 have got to the stage of actually doing that. And that's why I thank colleagues in the House uh, who actually indicated that they had taken that step. But unfortunately, that's what makes that further conversation that families have to have with clinicians, with other family members in regards to the consent principle, uh, and with those clinical experts and support nurses that come along with this legislation that gets us from that 46%, hopefully to 80%, or even up to the, to the 90% that we need to get there as well. So, In regards to, to further contributions and just in conclusion, I, I think, Mr Deputy Speaker, in regards to the contribution from Joanne Bunting, who said she came to this with an open heart, 
uh, and how this conversation is. And I think that's where some some members in, in this chamber, some members in, in the executive, were at that point of, of impasse. But what I will say, not just come to this conversation and this debate with an open heart, come to it with an open mind. So for those who have been saying they're not convinced or they need to hear more, you know, listen uh, to the evidence session that will come to the Health Committee where those, those challenges, those detailed uh, conversation and question and answer sessions can be had. Look to the responses to the consultation responses that my department actually conducted and where we are today in regards to that. Minister, yeah, well. uh, Minister uh, on my way here this morning, uh, I listened to the 10 o'clock news bulletin on BBC Radio Ulster and they featured uh, the give our time to a clinician. Order, can I ask the member to straighten the microphone so everyone can hear? Sorry. Uh, they give our time to a clinician who spoke against uh, the bill. Uh, I was certainly very disappointed. I'm sure the minister would have been disappointed to hear that as well. Would his views be representative of clinicians in general in Northern Ireland? Again, I thank the member for the question. I didn't hear the contribution, but you know, coming from the consultation responses um, that we did have, um, in that consultation, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we received uh, 1,917 written responses. Um, they included 108 responses from individuals identifying as health and social care professionals, of which a total of four said they were either opposed to organ donation or opposed to statutory opt-out, citing reasons around perceived intrusion uh, by government, and I think that was an issue that had been raised, but one will be taken forward, I'm sure, in conversation at, at the committee. But there were, were, and I will say to the member, a total of 15 responses were received from health professional groups or organisations, and none of those expressed opposition uh, to the proposed move. Uh, you will agree with me in recognising the amazing work of young Dahi McGahan and his uh, father marching, his mother Seth, and his engagement with the likes of the Armagh senior footballers, the Antrim senior footballers, the Antrim senior ladies footballers, in raising awareness on this all important issue. And by, through their engagement, they've worked towards getting this issue brought to the floor of this House, and they're literally saving lives. I think it's really important to recognise the bravery and the engagement of young Dahi and the family. You know, and I thank the member for his point. You know, and I, I know he wasn't here, here for the debate, but the number of times that Dahi, Martin and, Se and Seth were actually mentioned in the debate earlier this morning, I think, is a testimony to the work that they have done in promotion, promoting this legislation. And they've also said, you know, in regards to where we are and how we need to get on with this, this piece of work as well. And I'll join with, with, with their call in regards to that. And as I said, you know, in, in regards to anyone who's met Dahi knows the power. Uh, of meeting that young, young boy in regards to the, the spirit, the life that he currently has, and I think it's indicative of us to do all that we can uh, in progressing this piece of legislation through the House. Anyway, again, this is the second time I've been on my feet with regards to his intervention, so uh, it will be the last. There is this confusion uh, and this danger, Minister, that we fall into a trap when we're dealing with legislation that we can all say organ donation is very good, but organ donation legislation can be anything. It can be good, bad or indifferent. And our job as legislators is to make sure that the legislation on any given subject is as best as we can produce. I hear what the Minister says about taking it to the committee stage and then having an open mind, but ultimately with deemed consent it's either in it or it's not. Deemed consent is something you cannot amend away. It's either Colonel the Bill or it's not. And that way, if you are opposed in principle to deemed consent, then even if you come with an open mind, even if you come with an open heart, that principle will always remain. And again, I emphasise clinicians, no matter if they go on the radio or not, should be respected for their opinion and shouldn't be ridiculed in any shape or form if they hold an opinion. That's an honest personal opinion and I believe it's worth giving. Thank you. And, and I thank the member for, for his contribution but, but also in, the, in that wider debate as well has been had in, had in this public sphere and will be had uh, in the committee as well. But I, I, I think if I hear the member right, what he's actually saying is he's opposed to what this bill is. 
and this bill is actually about deem consent. That's where this bill moves. So, so you know, when we move now to, I suppose, calling the vote, and the deputy speaker will do that, and the member will have the opportunity then to oppose what he sees as the crux of this bill. You know, I, I think we've had the debate. I would ask him that he didn't divide the house on it, but again, that's within his democratic right. It's within his belief if he has, I suppose, that concern about what the deem consent actually means. To me, it says the next iteration of the conversation around organ donation in regards to where we've been. We've done the promotion, we've done the sale, and now we're doing what has been done in other parts of this United Kingdom in regards to moving uh, deem consent into legislation. Um, so once again, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am grateful to everyone who has contributed to this debate on what I believe is an important piece of legislation. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would ask members to support the organ and tissue donation deem consent bill I welcome the opportunity to work with the committee during the scrutiny of the bill. Uh, Mr Speaker, I beg to move. Members, the question is that the second stage of the organ and tissue donation deemed a consent bill be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. no. I think the ayes have it. No. I think the ayes have Clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes. I would remind you that we should continue to uphold social distancing, that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come into the chamber. Can I ask the clerk to read the result? 75 members voted, 69 members voted aye, 6 members voted no, 4 members who voted in both lobbies are not included in these results. The motion is carried. The motion is carried. The motion is carried. Unfastened doors. That concludes the second stage of the organ and tissues donation deemed consent bill. The bill stands referred to the Committee for Health.